I'm writing a lot about sense of place. Like everywhere I've lived, and I've been transient all my life because of my dad, his work, but also my own moving around. But I've lived everywhere from a town of 30, you know, to Austin, which is like a bazillion now or whatever, and then the Bay Area too. Um, everywhere in between and but everywhere I've lived I've made it a point to learn everything I possibly could about the geology like what made this place and then who's lived here you know from indigenous to pioneers or whatever our foreign correspondent Maggie Duvall returns to the Plutopia podcast updating us on her move from Austin to Taos, New Mexico. We discuss the differences in those two cities, COVID-19, the invasion of Texas developers, and much more. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to yet another episode of the Plutopia podcast, Plutopia News Network, bringing interesting interviews to you every week or more. Today, we're going to talk to Maggie Duvall, who was one of the original Plutopians. And she's uh, spent like the last three decades at the intersection of arts and technology. She's been part of what we call the internet industry. She's been a web developer. She's been an experienced designer. Uh, she was part of Burning Man in the early days. She's a board member for EFF Austin. And uh, she is currently a senior developer with Polycot Associates. And she has moved from Austin, Texas to Taos, New Mexico. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about here a bit. Hey, Maggie. Hola. Uh, yeah, and actually, January 1st was my first anniversary in Taos. So been here. Oh, really? Wow, been you've been here gone a, a year? year. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, kind of hard to believe, but you know, it is easier for me to track the time here than it was there because of the concept of seasons. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get yeah. it. Yeah, it's snowing right now, right? Well, it did snow. We had uh, a a big. Well, we had well a couple of weird things happen. Uh, the week before Christmas, we had the weirdest storm I have ever experienced in my life whipped through here. Um, talk about climate change. Uh, you all saw what happened in Boulder, right? Um, well, it was those same kind of winds, hurricane force winds. And yeah. um, they actually woke me. We thought we were just going to get like a snowstorm, a little wind, snowstorm, you know how it goes. But uh, I woke up at five because I kept hearing what sounded like lightning and explosions. Um, and that's, that's something you normally hear in Taos and where I am is really super, super duper quiet, right? You don't hear anything and it's super dark and all that um, very early in the morning. And I looked out my window uh, to the West across the Mesa and I saw this line of lightning hitting the ground and explosions. And I was like, wait, what is this like? the beginning of a, a new version of War of the Worlds, because that's what it felt like. <laughs> it oh really Lord. did. It was so surreal. And um, it was so bizarre that I woke my daughter up and I said, you have to witness this. I've never, never seen anything like this. And then it hit, it hit the house with, you know, it shook the house. And I have a really solid house. I saw things flying across the lawn and everything. Uh, not that there's a lawn, it's like a dirt pad. Anyway. Um, it was straight line winds blowing rain, snow, and sleet all at once. And, and it just, you couldn't see anything. And like about three inches of snow accumulated within an hour. So it would be wow. like, you would have like a, when we have our tropical things happen in Austin and it just blew my mind. And then I started hearing reports that everybody's power was down um, reports that they're, they were clocked 103 miles an hour at Wheeler Peak, uh, right above the Taos Ski Valley. Um, and, you know, the, the term hurricane force winds kept coming up. So, and it was that same storm that blew through, you know, as part of that atmospheric river, I believe, 
that blew through um, St. Louis, you know, the mid Midwest and just devastated. It was the same dang one. And then that thing happened in Boulder. So, um, you know, everybody's still been talking about that. But then, um, but, you know, other than that three inches, not a lot to happen. We were supposed to get snow on Christmas. That didn't happen. But um, a couple of days before um, uh, New Year's, we got a nice snowstorm. We got about uh, several feet in the mountains. We got eight inches at my house. And it dropped eight six below, Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it dropped to six below zero which wasn't fun when the power went out New Year's Day night Ooh. and we had no power for 15 hours and it was, like I said, six below zero. But I've lived in very small mountain places before. We have a wood stove. We had, you know, gas heat. So, you know, we survived. Sounds you know, like deja vu all over again with the meltdown we had last year. Right, and, and we already had a uh, you know a warning that we may not be all that safe, uh, even though uh, the Texas government said they really fixed everything with the power grid because that little yeah, right. th little measly uh, cold snap we just had, they had all these gas plants shut down in, in the neighborhood of John where John and I grew up out around middle of Odessa Big Spring. Right. Those, those gas plants froze, so it's like. Well, gee, really? the, the government. <laughs> took I didn't care. hear about that. That was just wow. that was just in the paper today. They I, well, but the story was that the government did fix everything, and and the fixes will be implemented by 2024, I think. Yeah, and they're and they're voluntary, basically. <laughs> they're, they're not, and they're voluntary. No right. one will go to yeah. prison if everyone freezes. Uh, you don't want to you know cramp their style and and encroach on their freedom to screw up oh heavens no <laughs> right. you know there's so many encroachments on freedom we wouldn't want to do that to those poor people they have right they have almost right. no rights at all in texas no wait that <laughs> that's, that's the opposite they have all the rights all the rights all the right well yeah and it's you know i noticed you know because i'm a weather nerd so when that storm blew through that front blew through and then when the cold snap came through that shut those down that you're talking about i was seeing uh our friend marvin uh in lubbock was talking about you know it was like seven degrees outside i was like uh oh that's gonna hit <laughs> austin that's gonna hit everything again you know and yeah it just makes me it blows my mind that it's almost like every week we have a catastrophic apocalyptic weather event and it's like oh you know, we're just so used to it now. We're, we don't even see that we're in it at this point. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Business as usual. You know, right. I'm as much of a paranoid that uh, I always pay attention to those things. You know, growing up out in tornado country where John and I grew right. up, uh, anytime the weather looked weird, I, I paid attention because I had too many friends that got <laughs> blown away because they didn't pay attention. Right, right. When that went, yeah, like things, I mean, but it's things that, yeah, you grew up with it. I grew up with a lot of it. And I've lived in all different parts of the country. So I know, you know, the you know, there's the hurricane blaze and the fireplace and the tornado place. Yeah, and, and when you'd see that, like what, what if, the pus colored clouds, <laughs> yeah. you know, like so accurate. Um, That's a good description, uh, actually. <laughs> it is, because it, it looks angry. It looks like it's about to burst, you know, and all that. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting how you know, in my, in my travels, how disconnected a lot of people are from uh, what their surroundings, you know, nature and all that is part of a lot of what, a, what I'm working on these days when I'm focused on, when I'm studying, what I'm writing about um, is that disconnection. So, yeah. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, that kind of training you get, uh, I, I grew up around farmers and ranchers out in right. te West Texas, and those people, their livelihood, their lives depend on knowing what's happening with the weather because you can't just leave the cattle out there in the uh, ice storm. You have to do something about them. Right. And uh, these old guys taught me all sorts of things. Ba basically, one of them said, if, if the cloud looks like it has gangrene, run, because the, that has a tornado <laughs> in it. And it's oh, yeah. true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I I think the the real problem that we have is that it's unstable weather and it's hard to predict anywhere. 
And you can't really expect anywhere to be sort of the way it's always been. Right. It's been, yeah. it, it was incredibly <laughs> warm here until, I guess, just after New Year's. That's right. Uh, I think New Year's Day was still pretty warm, but uh, the temperature dropped quite a bit and has stayed, it stayed pretty chilly here. It's like 40 degrees here now. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really cold. And then I thought, but this is really normal for this time of the year. Right. You know, <laughs> right. and it doesn't feel normal anymore. We're so right. used to being hot. What didn't feel normal was the fact that uh, I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt on Christmas. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> we didn't used to do that. That's no fun. Yeah. At least <laughs> it was cold here. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that happened when um, the power went out for 15 hours, I think that, um, you know, it, it, because they, uh, Kit Carson Cooperative, that's our power company here, you know, they've been continually trying to uh, fix everything that blew over. I mean, people's roofs blow up, blew off, um, trees hit buildings, you know, poles fell over, blah, blah. So they've been sort of trying to fix this and then this breaks and trying to fix this and this breaks. And so this is like a small community of 6,000 people, right? <laughs> Plus, we, you know, Red River and Angel Fire and all that. Um, what was interesting to me, and it didn't freak me out at all because I'm fine. I've always said this since, you know, being on the internet forever. Like if, if, if I didn't have any internet, what would I do? And it's like, well, I'd read a book, right? And um, what happened, um, our local Verizon tower fried too um, during the when the power went down. So I, I we, they kept trying to. It, it, I sensed that they had a Jenny, but there was problems with the Jenny too because it'd come on for a couple of minutes and then it was, but it was really slow and then it would be out for hours and then it'd come back on for a little while. Because usually, of course, yeah, you can use your your cellular data to kind of check in, but uh, we couldn't do that a lot. And I was like, you know, I'm okay with this. Um, but we also had to think about, you know, my, my car has been used to acclimated to Texas and now it's up, um, 7,000 feet higher and, uh, it's out in the cold. And so I had to make sure, you know, like, okay, the battery worked, that was great, but we couldn't, we didn't want to run it too long. We didn't want to charge things. <laughs> it was really interesting dancing around all these things that I never used to think about when I lived out in the sticks uh back you know 20 years ago or whatever <laughs> yeah, and you know on new year's eve i was at port aransas at the beach and the beach was packed it looked just like uh spring break and people were out wow. in the water they were you know that somebody was windsurfing and people were swimming and <sighs> wow it was it was like very surreal yeah, well, Maggie, oh you were God. talking about driving and the high level, uh, high altitude, and I experienced that first time I went up uh, skiing at uh, uh, in, in Santa Fe and, uh, and up around house, and right. you know I would all confused, and you know we talked to some of the locals, and they were they did the old eye roll like oh God, Flatlanders. <laughs> 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 and uh, you know, I didn't realize you, you know, if you were up there for any length of time, you really needed to get a tune-up that was uh, making you compatible with the, <laughs> that operating right. system. But right. I'm sure you're going to be now that you have snow that you'll be getting those people that cause the eye rolls coming up and taking <laughs> over Taos. Do you see a lot of that kind of reaction to, uh, oh God, it's the tourist again? <laughs> Uh, yeah, every once in a while, um, it's just kind of, uh, but I kind of get a sense of sort of giving up, you know, it's like, <laughs> there's no point, you know, it's just like, you just, uh, there's a kind of like a fl water flowing around the rock, you know, there's, there, there's the stupid, you just flow around it kind of thing. But, um, <laughs> I was, the stupid I was is happy. strong with that one. <laughs> right. I'm finding it hard to flow around stupid these days. I, I hear you. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it was really interesting during, um, you know, pre-Christmas, when, you know, everybody's starting to come in because they've come skiing for the holidays or, you know, you know, staying for the, the, the holidays here. And 
when, when our friends, the Vons were here, I said, don't worry, you're not those Texans. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you you're, you're in Austin. You're like, you're conscious of other people. Um, oh, I learned a new term. Okay. So the Texans that everybody doesn't like, there's a slang and they're called the Khmer's. The Khmer's. And I was like, what the hell? Khmer. Okay. Cause, cause a lot of these, those Texans will come in. It's like, come here, boy, come here, do this, this entitlement thing. <laughs> They're the come <Khmer's. laughs> Oh, I, I grew up around some come and <laughs> Yes. <laughs> they, Indeed. They were also known as attaboys. Yeah, exactly. So you got it. So I was like, yeah. So I keep trying to tell my friends like, hey, if the shoe fits, wear it. But you're not, you know, you're not, you don't seem to be wearing the shoes. So don't worry about it. You know, everybody's. I haven't had one negative experience here of anybody going like, oh, you know, I mean, of course I have a, I have a New Mexico license plate now, but everybody has been really nice. You know, it's like, if you're, if you're not an asshole, you won't be treated like an asshole. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just that easy. Yeah. The, the license plate, yeah, that, uh, strike that familiar tone with me because when I moved out to the, the Bay Area, I had my Texas license plate on my hippie van. And of, as soon as I got the California plate, I was treated differently. I got stopped less, which was kind of amazing. <laughs> Because I, yeah, you know, I, I just look suspicious no matter what the license plate I had. Right, right. Well, one one of the things I'm happy about is that, um, you know, my 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 truck thing is from 2008, and you know, Hunter was driving it when she was learning to drive. So there's some scrapes over here. <laughs> you know, there's a part where I hit something and the bumper's half falling off. I fit in perfectly here. It's great. It's just kind of like. Um, you know, you, you can't, you can't keep your car really nice here unless you wash it all the time and you have a garage because of the sand and the salt on the roads for, you know, and then it's dusty yeah. during, uh, during the spring and summer. So, um, I'm, I feel like it's <laughs> a nice camouflage. <laughs> well, I imagine, you know, having icy roads tends to, uh, put some dings and, and dents in, uh, everyone's right. cars. I, I experienced that when I was, uh, working up in uh, Alaska for uh, a few weeks and oh, wow. we got a rental car and it was almost falling apart. I mean, it was held together with duct tape and bailing wire. And they told us that's just how cars are because after a, a, a winter or two, they're done. <laughs> right, absolutely. You, you're lucky yeah. if it has any paint at all. The one thing I was really happy about as well is that, um, I, you know, from, cause I'm, I'm a for, former Coloradoan too. I mean, I, uh, graduated high school in Colorado and all that lived there 10 years of my life. And so I'm, I'm used to, I learned to drive in the snow. So that's kind of handy to have that skill, um, intact. And, you know, and as long as I, I mean, I, as long as I don't hit black ice, I'll be a happy camper, but, <laughs> so, but generally here, um, you know, like those first few days, you didn't have to worry about the black ice because it was, um, it was too cold for anything to melt. So, um, yeah, it, usually everybody's pretty chill. Um, you know, you'll get some macho types that'll be barreling through stuff, but, um, I don't know. It just, it, it's seems pretty easy, but I guess I've kind of slowed down like literally and figuratively <laughs> by moving here it's you know rush hour lasts maybe 10 minutes like, you think that covid has had a bit in, big impact on tasks um my feeling about you know of course who am i to speak about anything but because because the um uh, the the pueblos and um and the Hickory and the and the and the um, and the Navajo, the Diné, have been hit so hard. What what's been interesting is that the they've all been closed. They're gated. You cannot go in. You know, um, there's a we're going to take care of our own kind of thing. And um, it it just COVID hit families up here pretty hard because everybody's so into familia. You know, the family get together. So you know, somebody to get together for an event and everybody gets sick. And then Governor Grisham, Lujan Grisham, you know, had all the protocols last year. 
and it, and it worked pretty good. And I, again, I really, after being in Texas, I really appreciated getting here last year and signs all over town, mask up, mask up, mask up. And, you, you know, people would really hold firm on you cannot come in here um, at all, or you can only have two people at a time. You have to be mass. You know, they, it's, it, it was a different thing. Um, but yeah, these, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of poverty up here, of course. And, um, you know, so people have to be a lot more careful. So that's, that's why I think a lot of people get angry. I get angry when you have, like in the grocery store, everybody's being mass and then you'll have those Texan types come marching in, you know, their whole family, no mask. They're like, no, 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 all loud and everything. And everybody's kind of <laughs> scooting around. And <laughs> yeah, nobody's masking down here. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, mean, but- I say nobody there. There are obviously people who are masking, but right. we were, we've been kind of surprised. We've taken a couple of trips recently in Texas and uh, it was very common to you know, walk into a place and have nobody masked. We would be right. like the only ones. Right. And uh, a little scary to sit in a, a restaurant, you know. Uh, of course, in a restaurant, people aren't going to wear their masks while they're eating, but you would think that they would at least wear their masks when they walk through the door. But no, right. I mean, nobody was really, it's as though it's not a thing anymore, really. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I, was, I was just talking to, um, um, our polycots about um, a, a tale of two restaurants here that I noticed. Um, there's this really great place, the Farmhouse Cafe. Nothing wrong with them, you know. This is nothing against them at all. But I was there with some visiting friends um, several months ago, and kept having to tell the waiter to please put his mask back on because he kept doing the chin thing or under the nose thing. It's like just don't wear it if you you know you're missing the point. And the whole idea of like every time they pull it up, their hands are touching everything, (laughs) you know, just kind of tweaked me out, right? At least we were outside too. But then there's this, um, uh, so, you know, there's some, you know, there's some management that'll be on it. Others are not. There's this other wonderful restaurant just down the hill from me called uh, Antonio's and um, it's interior and interior Mexican and Mexican food. Next time anybody's here, go visit it. It's fantastic food. But I loved when I was in there uh, recently and there, you know, sanitation station right when you walk in, before you walk in, everybody's masks, you have to wear a mask and all that. And then when you're at the table, what was great is that, you know, the way the waiter is really friendly and all that, but gloved, masked. And what he would do is when he'd bring the food, he'd have one arm behind his back and he'd turn his face away and just kind of slide it on your table. I hadn't seen that before and it felt better, you know, yeah. and they really separated. So there was a conscientiousness like to protect their people to protect the people, um, you know, their patrons. And like, what a concept. It's not that hard, you know. <laughs> well, we need to kidnap uh, some of those people and bring them here. Uh, right. Living here in Jade Helm County, uh, um, <laughs> it's a uh, mask. Uh, we'll put, you know, we'll definitely single you out as a weirdo because <laughs> I'll go out to stores and such. And they have the signs up and you know the people working in the stores they are they're all masked they're all right. doing the right thing but you know bubba jr and his wife are out there just you know yeehawing around and uh <laughs> my rights <laughs> and, and then they give you the stink eye when they say you're wearing a mask it's like Ooh, right. obviously right. a communist <laughs> uh yeah i yeah i was I was in the shower this morning (laughs) where all these weird ideas come bubbling up. And I was thinking, what would it be like now if Trump hadn't been president and COVID had hit? Like, where would we be now? Well, we probably, I mean, it would be like H1N1 or some of the others that have hit and were contained. You know, we we had swine flu and all that stuff and it all uh, didn't you know, go out of control like this did because we, we had sane people or well, relatively sane, you know, for politicians. Right. I mean, right. I guess I, I tend to believe that, that the fact that Trump was president 
created huge problems for us that we might not otherwise have had. But I, but I will note that I'm, uh, the, uh, other parts of the world have had the same kind of problems, right. you know, uh, and, and even some of the places that really locked down effectively, it seemed like they've still had, had surges from time to time. Right. So maybe this really is a different beast, you know, something different from what we've seen before. And, I, and really, it kind of is. I mean, at least H1N1 was a strain of flu. Right. And flu, our bodies know, but flu, our bodies didn't really understand this, this COVID virus. Very yeah, that's much. why it's called novel, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, all of us are science fiction fans. We've read all of those stories at the end of the world, and it's like, Hmm, maybe I'm a character in some weirdo science fiction author's end of the world novel. Station 11. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Well, so living in Taos, do you feel like you're kind of, is there some sense of being removed from all the craziness, you know, that, uh, that we have in, places like well texas is one i mean you don't you're in a state where they don't have so many republicans right yeah, that's run well, by democrats uh, we, we do have uh uh you know down in as you can imagine down in the southeast corner it's very republican because that's where the oil and gas is so um permian basin you know it's uh, perched on the permian basin there so um, and then where all the UFOs Las, are too. That's right. And then, uh, like Las Cruces, there's a lot of retirees there. Uh, so it's more Republican, you know, I'm surprised that Taos hasn't turned Republican because there's so many retirees up here and not to say that everyone that's a retiree, you know, but there's a certain, you know, anyway, um, but yeah, generally, uh, it's, 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 it's a, you know, again, it's a blue state, thankfully, um, people, um, like in the early, uh, in, you know, like maybe in the forties, fifties, sixties, uh, Taos was still kind of super conservative because of the more traditional Hispanic families from my understanding. Right. And then, um, and then when the hippies came in in the sixties, there was a lot of pushback um, from the locals because they were just, you know, horrified by, you know, the drug use and the sex and blah, blah. Um, but now there seems to be some kind of, there were, the, there were those folks, at least as far as I can tell, and I've been studying a lot this year to learn more about this area. I know a lot about other, you know, Santa Fe and all that, but, um, you know, a lot of these folks, uh, you know, a lot of the communes dissolved or morphed into something new. I mean, Lama Foundation is still there and they're doing wonderful things. But, um, you know, a lot of these people sunk down roots and became part of the community. And there's there's there seems to be a mutual respect between certain people. Right. That that have, um, you know, really. Um, have uh you know made a point to be part of the community it feels like there's a community here even though there's a lot of factions um uh, you know and that's why I, I helped with uh i've been helping with this group la coalition de taos that um has been spearheaded by this woman anita otilia rodriguez um who was just like wait, our, our town's being taken away. We got to do something about it. And there was no like just us or you or whatever, you know, this group of women came together and I've just been, I put their website together for them. It's just a landing page for now and then we'll develop it out later. But um, what does it mean to say that the town is being taken away? What's happening there? So um, it, it's been, uh, and, and, and actually if, if anybody ever wants to kind of get a sense of the, the, kind of the Taos thing. Um, so it's developers, right? It's a lot like the Texas Ski Valley is owned by a Texan. Oh my um, God. You know, there's a, a commercial that we see about every 30 minutes on television shows that carry commercials. Uh, some guy who's talking about, they said that I was mad and I really was. And it's a, for a Taos ski resort. Right, right. Right. Yeah. So 
there's that, um, there's, you know, there's, uh, we just, like a lot of that money for, uh, for you know, uh, COVID stuff, business and grants and everything, the, the airport, which is a tiny airport, um, which only serves Taos Air, which brings people from Austin, Houston, and I believe LA, and then to serve private jets, like Lear jets or whatever, they just got something like 172 billion or something. <laughs> I, I don't know the exact numbers, but this huge grant to expand the airport, improve it. Nobody wants it except the, the people that use it to fly in to bring water out there. And then the, uh, and then the insult was that affordable housing got $72,000. It, it, it's ridiculous. There's all these issues of infrastructure falling apart and all that. It's, there's this feeling of, and I've seen it, this has happened in Santa Fe, where it's becoming kind of the Southwest Disneyland. Like the, the tourism model is like, this is this, this spiritual, wonderful place. And it's a, you know, but like, don't, just ignore the people that live over here in those trailers. They, you know, they have nothing to do with this area. Um, there's talk of the town of Taos wanting to annex uh, Ranchos de Taos, which I live on the border um, of. It's um, very small, uh, integrated, very old community. Houses really close together, um, uh, you know, because people want to develop the crap out of it. They want to put, you'll see, you'll see this, these small community houses and you'll see this monstrosity um, Fodobi up on the hill, you know, above, you know, the riffraff and all that. And um, so there's a, so anyway, I was talking about the books to read. I highly recommend this. Uh, people have heard of this one, the Malagra Beanfield War. Oh yeah. John Nichols has chronicled and uh, loves the people of this valley with his heart and soul. So this one kind of gives you the idea, you know, you, you've seen the story, it's, it's sort of more contemporary. Then there's this one called The Magic Journey. It's part of his trilogy. It gives you a sense of the history of the, the developers coming in and what it's done to the people. And then the third book in the trilogy is called the Nirvana Blues. It's like the hippie times, right? And so it's just um, it's just how this valley and these people. I've got another one to show you too. Um, this one's called um, Enchantment and Exploitation. Um, it's just uh, some really good stuff about how these people have been continually screwed over uh, in the name of you know, tourism and development and all that. And, um, you know, like, could we find part of like the coalition is teaching people about the people who are here and what's going on and who they are and not just this sanitized version, you know, of the, like, I'm always joking about, you know, some, some dude in buckskins, you know, his hair's blowing back and he's playing the Indian flute and like you hear the pew <laughs> all over it. oh i used to see those people all the time in santa fe and in towns it's like <laughs> and i knew they weren't locals <laughs> right, exactly. you know i was exposed to this idea recently i think in, in reading the dawn of everything which i'm still kind of reading um but this idea that uh if you live off the land but you don't develop it then mm -hmm. you sh you have no property right in the land right that's right. kind of like the western capitalist philosophy absolutely so so if land is sitting there and people are just living on it and they're not doing anything to develop or exploit it then why should they have any right to the land right. the land should right. go to somebody who will actually make use of it yeah you like know, oil just companies. living on the land <laughs> is not enough right and the, and the idea of like if you don't uh, i read recently uh, what was the line? Something about um, if you don't know a place, you don't care for it, right? It's just, it becomes an object. Nature yeah. is an object, not um, part of part of us, like family, right? And and the people here think of the land, the, you know, the, the locals, who you think of as the locals, um, you know, the land 
is their mother and their nourishment and has been a partner since the beginning of everything the way the 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 secchia system which is the you know the water how people manage the water and it's for the community it's not for one person you know and the um that it i mean this this valley is super lush they grow like wheat here and you know i i mean it's amazing what you can grow up here you know for four months out of the year um but yeah i mean it's all the other thing that's distressing me like ojo caliente is owned by texans and they've they've sanitized it and they're developing it so much that if it's really nice but if to me i went there a long time ago when there was just a hut you paid your like six bucks to get in and and now it's like 45 dollars to soak for the day and um it's really busy all the time and and it's just it, it, the soul is missing and they're yeah. they're trying to that's what they're and then they bought these other springs in santa fe oh santa fe everything's sanitized for your protection it's all about the commodification and not the connection it, it's it's about more disconnection from what's there and when i was talking at the the top of the hour you know that's my focus right now i'm writing a lot about sense of place like everywhere i've lived and i've been transient all my life because of my dad his work but also my own moving around but i've lived everywhere from a town of 30 you know to austin which is like a bazillion now or whatever and then the bay area too um everywhere in between and but everywhere i've lived I've made it a point to learn everything I possibly could about the geology, like what made this place? And then who's lived here, you know, from indigenous to pioneers or whatever. Like when I was in Austin, um, when I lived in Slackerville, I, you know, I, I learned all about um, the slaveholder uh, Bolden, you know, and that, that whole corridor on East Bolden Creek. Yeah was where all the, the the freedmen lived after the Civil War. And the house we lived in before we moved up north, Austin, was a freedman's house. And I really felt, felt the sense of that place. You know, like what, and I would imagine, like, what was it like when these people were living here and they were growing their own food and, there, and then the, there was the grocery up the at Live Oak and Mary or whatever it was. And, you know, just learned about it. I wanted to learn about, you know, like where we were, we had a Comanche marker tree, right? And I was thinking about, okay, what route was it pointing out to go toward the Colorado River? You know, it's pretty obvious, <laughs> just stuff like that. And, um, and, and, and it's amazing, like how, how little a lot of folks knew. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so when you hear like, you know, the lofts of Bolden, it's like, do you know who he was? I mean, just saying. Um, and then where we lived up in uh, North Austin, there by Spicewood Springs, you know, learning about Spicewood Springs that, you know, all the springs along that ridge right above Shoal Creek that fed Shoal Creek that are all concreted and asphalt over now. And that that whole area was thick with, I mean, it was a stronghold and, you know, it's a height. So you could see off into the hills of the Tonkawa and the, and the Comanche. And th there's something about feeling all the people that have lived there that made it more connected to me and learning about the nature and all that. But how, how many people actually do that, especially in our kind of suburbia kind of culture where you really never go out you know, some people walk and they think they'll look around and they'll go, oh my God, you know, like I, I see your pictures, John, you know, you're always, oh, there's this bird, there's this beautiful stand of, you know, whatever, but a lot yeah. of people don't do that. And, and so I've been thinking about that connected to something our friend um, Tall Leeds told me at one point, he said, Maggie, you should like somehow get these tech bros and connect them again they they're just they're all it's all about in the head and there's nothing about the rooted to the earth and connected and i've been thinking about that a lot so and that's what i know i'm giving a long answer to your question but it's what's come up for me 
now that I'm not surrounded by all this noise, you know, the constant, I didn't realize how fried my circuits were, my nerves, my nerve endings, everything. You know, Austin's a pretty hyper city. Totally. And it, it, it's kind of like how I love being in the Bay Area when I did. But then I got fried out because I wanted to output instead of all this input and excitement. Right. And so it's kind of that situation again. And yeah. it's, what I like about it is that I can pick up s signals from the noise a lot better. You know, I still know what's going on in the world, but I don't even I rarely look all the times. Maybe once a day I'll see something. I was like, OK, whatever. But I also find I'm not getting like wound up by I don't give a crap about the social media stuff. I'm starting to step back now a little bit and go like, yeah, there's a lot of wanker out there, but there's also a lot of really cool stuff going on. So um, that's what I'm trying to tease out. Yeah, I found know? that uh, getting out of the uh, big city uh, lowered my blood pressure. I mean, I, right. I became healthier just by getting the hell out of town. Right. And uh, you were talking about uh, the southeastern uh, part of your state. And I was just right. reading about the dispute down there between uh, Andrews County in Texas and whatever the neighboring county is in New Mexico. Maybe Chavez, maybe Chavez County. Yeah. Like the, yeah. The low, the supposedly low level radioactive waste storage facility they have in Andrews. Oh, the wet facility. Is yeah, the and they're wanting yeah. to bring in nastier stuff. And the conservative politicians in New Mexico are like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll benefit from that too. So they, they're they all, uh, you know, buddy-buddy now with all of the uh, folks from Texas. Oh, so God. That, and, and that all relates to the, the move to shut down the uh, big storage facility in uh, uh, is it Yucca Flats. Yucca Mountain, right, yeah. In Nevada, yeah, and because they want to do something with that, because that's all a big uh, nightmare. They, and everyone in that part of New Mexico is like, "Yeah, we we'll take it." It's like, "No, you won't." Yeah, <laughs> no a, thanks. Yeah, that's idiot. called the yeah, John. If you look it up, it's W uh, the acronym W I P P Waste Something Something Facility or I don't know. And yeah, when I before I moved to Austin. Um, there was this big stink because they were were building it. Everybody was protesting, mm -hmm. and it's the same like strat built in the same strata as Car Carlsbad Canyons. Yep. Carlsbad, yeah, Carlsbad, yeah, caverns. caverns. Thank you. Yeah, and um, and yeah, it's not delightful. And yeah, they're uh, <laughs> making their own Carlsbad caverns for. That's uh, very attractive. Yeah, yeah. nice yeah. shade of orange. <laughs> it's wonderful. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's been, yeah, at that time, they, uh, if you've ever driven up 285 from like Fort Stockton to, to Klein's Corners and all that, um, it's like a four lane highway. The only reason it's a four lane highway is because they did that to bring the waste down from Los Alamos, but they, and that's the only reason they built the relief route um, around uh, uh, Santa Fe is that you, you see see these weird containers and i i like would drive like way far away from them that's bringing radioactive waste down to the whip facility it's just creepy as hell and i and i read recently i have to research it more but i think i saw some blip about los alamos is amping back up like nuclear trigger development and and creation it's like why yeah so anyway this really is out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Look at that. Wow. Mm -hmm. There you go. Right. Oh, there's good old Orla. <laughs> oh my Every time Lord. I've gone through there, I've stopped in Orla. I don't know why. Old ghost. Ghost town. It's a Kermit, Texas, and Wink. Where Roy Orbison <laughs> yeah. was born. Yeah. Well, we're touching all the big uh, metropolitan areas of the West. <laughs> really? There are also some of the infection centers of the West now. Uh, just looking at the COVID uh, outbreaks in West Texas and uh, uh, Eastern New Mexico seems to be you know hit pretty well right. too. And it's right. all those deniers out there. Well, and and I wonder how long it's going to take for them to continue to deny. I, I 
I think now I know of, I think COVID is now one degree of separation. You know, for a while there it was out a few levels, but now I, every day I hear about somebody else I know who family member or they have or whatever. I'm like, uh, this is kind of <laughs> a little too close for comfort. Yeah. And it's sad to see these people's families that were leading the denial, uh, you know, Ugh. charge yeah. And they're and then now they're dead from from right. COVID. Even Dan Patrick, our lieutenant governor, is recovering from COVID. He, oh. You know this all this part of the map, Texas and New Mexico, uh, a month or so ago was very light colored. Right. You know, right. it's just really uh, accelerated quite a bit. Yeah. And, so uh, throughout Texas and throughout New Mexico too. When we were in New Mexico. It was, uh, there was very little there, but now, as you can see, it's getting darker, darker, meaning more cases. Right. That, that kind of darker orange up in the north of uh, New Mexico one, that's Taos County. So it's, yeah. I've seen it going up, but it, we're not quite as bad. But I, I have to say, I am glad that there is the, there's a little bit of best of both worlds thing here because, um, you know, not being packed in with a bunch of people is great. And there are also some, like the store does curbside. So <laughs> I'm happy about that. And there's lots of nature to get out to, to get the vitamin D amped up. Wow. I, you know, I heard today that uh, the University of Texas has done some projections and they're convinced that uh, this particular surge of COVID will be over in about a week. Yeah. Wow. Based, I was shocked. Based upon what? <laughs> well, yeah. models. Well, and I don't know what went into those models. Uh, the mo there were a lot of models that said uh, Donald Trump was going to be elected. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to watch out for that modeling. Uh, That's right. <laughs> yeah, is it M O T T uh, only? Yeah, because <laughs> uh, we'll peak. We'll, we'll peak in the next few days, is what they say. Yeah, the, there's a lot of people who are in the scientific community that are saying this is basically going to be the new normal. Yeah, wow. yeah. In fact, there was quite a bit of discussion about that today about how uh, the experts in infectious diseases are telling the Biden administration that they should regard this as the new normal and that uh, we'd be in much better shape if they just did that. Yeah. As long as you, have... I don't know what that means exactly. I don't know what, mm -hmm. how you translate new normal. Yeah. Right. Well, given the current level, level of political dysfunction, there really will be no miracle cure because there's too many people denying it and fighting it, you know, the efforts to do, do these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think at this point it's like, what do you even do? Because there's, there's no, there's no way to get people aligned, obviously. And, you know, again, it's just the thing that kind of keeps me up at night sometimes is the idea of, you know, kind of going back to those apocalyptic climatic events like when things are falling apart, when there's not enough beds in the hospital, when there's not enough people to take care of people in the hospital, and then you have something like, you know, like, well, you know, you scoop the Hayward fault, right? Mm -hmm. and the, all the all the hospitals and the fire stations are right on that damn fault all the way down the East Bay. And that I remember that concern after Loma Prieta, like if that goes and the hospitals are tanked and everything you know and then you have uh not to be all doomy gloomy here but i mean it, it's kind of like it's kind of like we're living like societally paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. yeah i live like, two miles from the uh, hayward fault so that was a constant reminder right uh, right well yeah not looking forward to that, <laughs> but yeah i I don't know. I just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by a number, how many of my friends are leaving Texas and buying land 
um, it was like, oh, wow, you're actually doing it now. That It makes me think of rats and sinking ships and things. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, yeah. On the other hand, uh, the U-Haul truck people say that the uh, I think Texas is number three in the most one-way truck rentals that end up here. So Yeah, there's a lot of people coming here, too. Yeah. That's right, for sure. right. Yeah. And a lot of them are coming from California and uh, and from and from some of the more conservative states. I guess they want to come be with right. their own. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's go ahead. I mean, we 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 have a thriving economy. Uh, it's considered a great place to do business. Elon Musk is here. He brought Tesla right. to Texas. I think um, Ron's coming or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a. Uh, it's like a gold rush only it's not for gold you know it's just right. for i don't know maybe tax breaks or whatever yeah. well it reminds me of the silicon rush of for silicon valley when that was first starting to to pump up and they're doing the same thing you know samsung's going to go to taylor texas which is oh, wow. you know a tiny little town with no infrastructure at all so that's got to be a nightmare for uh the locals and a you know a gold mine for samsung Right. I was hanging out with people who were laying the groundwork for this, you know, 20 years ago. And, uh, and, you know, we really did want to turn Austin into something like Silicon Valley. We thought that would be great. And uh, I, I have had second thoughts about that. Yeah, be careful what you wish <laughs> for. You might get it. <laughs> well, that's why I was cracking up when I was reading your, uh, the state of the world thing about, we thought the internet would make people smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong about that. Um, yeah, I, I read something yesterday about uh, this scared me. Uh, the whole idea of, um, you know, after having the housing rush there, now I'm reading that people are bidding on rentals. Like they're, they're saying like, oh, oh God, I need that. There's not enough rentals available or something like yeah. even with all the building. And so people are like, bid, okay, I'll pay 500, you know, dollars. It's a are really high here. Oh my God. I'm so glad I got out. I wouldn't be able to survive. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned that about <clears throat> what we used to think about the internet. And I can tell you a, a speech that I made many times about fringeware when we, you know, when we were putting fringeware together, Right. I would tell people in every little town and, in the country and probably in the world, there's people who are really kind of not like everybody else. They're kind of on the fringes. They think differently and they have no way to find people who are like them. And uh, the internet will allow those people to find each other. Yeah. And it never occurred to me that those people would find each other and form QAnon, you know? <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? What was I talking about, you know? Oops. Oh, can We've we blame you, John? Madness, John. Can right. we blame you then? Uh, uh, you can blame the people <laughs> I was working with. Okay. Well, it, it, yeah, kind of. You know, that's a that's a good thing to bring up. I've been thinking about this a little bit about how fun it was in the it, back in those days when uh, you know I miss uh, BBSs, right? I miss. Oh yes. Like, you know, connecting with really cool people in the Bay Area on the BBS, right? And then all the mutant people that were into the sci-fi and the and the and the action figures and all that. You know, nobody it felt like cool and special because only a few of us knew about this. And then yeah, and all the weird conspiracy stuff was just like funny, weird you know. Conspiracy we, stuff. Yeah, I, <laughs> we we laughed and laughed at InfoWars. We thought, oh that's really funny, those guys, right. you know. It never occurred to me that people would start taking Alex Jones seriously. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And and what's uh Hunter and I have had a good talk about this related to um you know I've I've taught media literacy classes before um and it's like Jesus Christ we should have been teaching the freaking adults because <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, at least a lot of the kids, I mean, everybody likes to make fun of the kids and like Tide Pods and all that shit. But, um, you know, at least they have some sense of, oh, that's total bullshit, you know, or this is, you know, there, there's a healthier whatever. But God, when we got people, 
you know, God damn AOL, <laughs> damn you AOL, you mm -hmm. know, like getting all these people on with AOL and it's just like, they don't know, oh my God, I was thinking about how many people like in the 2000s, I'd have to, you know, and I was doing tech support to help elders get online and it's like, no, this guy in Nigeria does not have your best interest at heart, you know? Like, yeah, we used to do an eye roll and laugh when somebody would say, I read it on the internet, you know, right? that was always a big joke. It's like, you can't believe anything you read on the internet. And now, right. yeah. you know, we have people who have leveraged that great communications medium that we built in order to build an authoritarian right-wing army, right. really. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, and they're just so, uh, you know, there's that same, uh, I don't know. It, it makes me sad because there's so much behind it I see of these people, like the kind of the Karen or Chad mentality is like they so desperately want to be seen and important, right? And like, Trump and QAnon and all that has answered that for them. It's like, mm -hmm. it makes them feel like they're part of, what's right. that term about? Um, they're just like delayed one percenters or something. It was, it, it, I read it the other day, it cracked me up. It's kind of like what I say where they know that if they support Trump, eventually they'll get their invite to Mar a Logo, you know, or whatever. Oh, <laughs> of course. Right. He's going to make them rich. Well, Joe Rogan's <laughs> moving to all the uh, conserv ultra conservative uh, social media. So, uh, you know, they, wow. yeah, there's something for you to look forward to. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> my God. Yeah. So. But I don't really think of Joe Rogan as one of those people, you know. I, well, he says he a lot of strange like, stuff. Huh? He says a lot of strange stuff. I guess. I I haven't watched him in a while. I was watching his YouTube streams at one time. And, you know, mostly he didn't seem to take too many positions. He just kind of let people go. And a lot of the people he interviewed were just fine. Uh, but apparently he's moved to the right. A lot of people have moved yeah. to the right. Well, there's a lot of bandwagon jumpers. Just like, oh, this looks like the way to go. So <laughs> let me be one too. Yeah, well, I, I guess was... it has a certain gravity. So I totally missed the whole. Uh, I was watching a really funny video today from Vice. I'll have to send it to you guys. It's like kind of like where are they now kind of thing. I had no idea that Scott Adams. Dilbert, oh yeah dude. i had where when did that when did that happen i missed that one. Oh, uh, that's he's been that way for as long oh as i God. can remember yeah, yeah i think he drank yeah. the kool-aid at some point because he, he used to be uh, the guy that we would clip out those things and right. post them to you know, to, to irritate all the consultants who were coming into our, our <laughs> it group and all of a sudden he was one of them right <laughs> well and you know that there was there have been people who were kind of on the right and conservative for forever, you know, and I've known those people and I've talked to them and they were reasonable. Right. You know? But that ain't that ain't the case now. They've gone a little bit bonkers. And uh but I you know, I think about I think about what happened on the left back in the sixties. And you know, maybe we were a little bonkers too, uh, when we got jacked up about of course we were really concerned about the war in vietnam right and a lot of what was happening back then was uh was a result of our sort of consciousness about the purposes of that war and you know that people were actually being sent off to die for something that they didn't really believe in right. and yeah. that seemed you know it seemed pretty compelling but you know in the same way that uh, certain people have seized on and leveraged some of these energies on the right now there were also people seizing on some of those energies on the left and and taking advantage right. of them oh yeah the hip opportunists were everywhere in uh, berkeley especially right. yeah and the thing is it's all just the worst kind of politics and people should be very skeptical about politics and politicians you know and right. really be careful about what they actually let themselves believe and i don't see that skepticism it used to be that people on the right seemed pretty skeptical about that stuff but they right. were mostly skeptical of the left but still but their skepticism is out the window and really there's a left-wing element that's not you know i mean people just want to believe stuff right and 
and you can be belief is uh, when you give yourself over to belief, you're opening yourself up to exploitation. Right. And that's, uh, this is a good segue into a good end for, for this uh, show. Um, uh, one of the things that La Coalition is, is doing is hosting two different forums with the mayoral candidates and the town council t- candidates. And the whole idea is giving them, um, so presenting them in a way where it's about everybody asking questions. And these are going to be coming in before and be asked by a moderator and holding their feet to the fire so they can't do the soundbite bullshit political speak stuff. We want to know what they really feel about stuff. And let me just, uh, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I'll send you guys that info too. Um, But like some, uh, uh, I sent out the newsletter for the group last night and this guy sent uh, back questions. Some of these are like this. This will give you a sense of Taos. What is your definition of inclusiveness and what specific steps can the town take to become more inclusive? What, why do you think there are so many suicides among Taos youth? What do youth want, need from adults who want to be their allies? How do you know this? Define colonization and what do you see are its impacts on Taos? <laughs> Audre Lorde quote, you'd better name yourself or others will do it for you. What does this quote mean to you? How do you self-identify and why? Share a true story about when you've been an ally to a marginalized group. Has the colonization of Taos affected attitudes and behavior of present day Taos residents? Yes or no, please explain your answer. How has racism affected decisions made by Taos government? (laughs) Oh, I want you to run the next presidential debates. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Imagine Taos five years from now. How is it different? And then 10 to 1 was, how will we know when Taos has made significant progress toward eliminating racism? What are the specific indicators? I mean, this is going to be, these forums are going to be fantastic, and we're going to be recording them, and then we'll be uh, putting them up on the website, so later on you can watch, too. It's, it's, I'm really excited about it, because it feels like interactive government. It's like there, there's accessibility, and, you know, sometimes, and being in a smaller town, instead of the big town where you get lost and all that, you... You, yeah. I think a lot of people want to be more involved, but there's all these barriers in between because it's so big. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Maggie. Thank you. See that you next fun. time. Sweet Later. Day, you you too. too. We'll see you soon. Okay. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.